It's 4 o'clock on a Thursday, and you know what that means. It's an unusual time for an episode of Taxi TV Live. This week, starring special, special guest star, Mr. Ren and Purcell, all the way from Sandy, Utah. Land of many beaches. <laughs> Why the hell do they call I, it Sandy? It's, it's, the, it's the ground. <laughs> I, sandy. I learned that when we tried to do a yard with grass and everything. It's just uh, sand. Okay, well, anyway, hi. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. So, uh, I know this is an odd time to have a show, but uh, Randon, check us this way, just a pinch. Yep. Let's get us both in that shot. Randon uh, shot me an email the other day and said, hey, I'm in town. Want to try and grab some dinner or something? And I said, I've got a better idea. Because (laughs) right when he reached out to me, I was editing the passenger profile, which... I don't even know how many pages are in here, but he did a a really, really good job uh, of answering um, a lot of questions that I asked him for the passenger profile. And it was so good that I cut none of it for length, and we ended up putting it into four um, episodes, or not episodes, what do you call them? Um, Editions? Yeah, four Uh, editions of the monthly newsletter, the Taxi (laughs) Transmitter. Uh, The fourth one is coming out, I think, tomorrow. And... I was sitting there literally thinking, man, this guy's answers are so good. And then he goes, I'm going to be in town. So here he is. <laughs> but before we proceed any further, because Bria is already kicking me under the table, <laughs> make sure that you subscribe to this channel so that, wow, people are actually showing up on a Thursday. Yay. What could possibly be more exciting than a, a Senate inquiry or whatever that thing is? Um, don't forget to share this with your friends and your senator. Uh, and like us, because we're just so likable. Anyway, now that that's done and out of the way. Um, so I've got to say, I'm very, very proud of the passenger profiles that we've been getting for the last few years. The members who've done these have been really, really good. And this one was just exceptional. I think I either emailed you or called you. And just right, said, yes, thank you. Dude, <laughs> it's like... So much great information that I've actually been pondering turning all the passenger um, profiles I've done in the last few years into a book. So that is that remains to be seen. And I'm going to do something unusual because I'm rather than reinventing the questions, right. um, I'm going to use some of the questions that I've used during uh, the interview that you did for the profile. Uh, figuring that not every single one of you has actually read all three and possibly <laughs> the fourth uh, profile yet. But I am going to start at the end, and I'm going to read your answer and then ask you a question after it. Right. So I started out by saying, is there anything you know now? Remember, this is the end of part four, uh, very near the end. Is there anything you know now that you wish you'd known when you first started going down your music path? And Randon answered, well, I wish I'd known early on that there was a good practical way to make money writing music for media. If I'd understood that 15 years ago, I'd be light years ahead in my music career. He also said for a second answer, or second part of that, I wish I'd known the taxi could really help me back in 2002 when I first heard of taxi. Don't they all? I still slap <laughs> myself for not joining then. Um, I wish I'd known that it's possible to write music to briefs without compromising your int- artistic integrity at all. Really, really, really important. And he said, I wish I'd gained even the slightest bit of knowledge about the industry from a business perspective long before I tried to dive in as a musician. That, to me, is so, so (laughs) important because we see this all the time from people who are truly talented, uh, maybe varying degrees of talent in certain things that they're trying, but a lot of talented musicians who love the creative aspect of the industry, Right. they don't learn about the business side, and then they just kind of blithely throw their music out there, and when they get hit in the face with, I'm sorry, it's not what we need, or it's not right, or it's not good enough, then it's the industry's fault. Yes, yeah, when exactly. Your observation was so astute that, you know, learn the business stuff it maybe beforehand um, because doesn't it help it is. you I uh, mean, find a direction? And I've, I've, you know, referred a lot of people to Taxi, obviously, because it works. Thank you. And, um, you know, a lot of people have that same misconception that if my music's good enough, it's going to get, you know, on a show right. or a movie. It's like... A lot of times it doesn't have to do with how good it is necessarily. <laughs> I, I, if it fits. I mean, we've offered some not. really terrible songs on TV shows yes. and movies and everything, right? Uh, and really good ones as well, of course. But 
I always tell everybody, look, sign up for Taxi because it works, but don't sign up if you can't take some constructive criticism. You, you know, and that's the one thing I really love about Taxi is getting that constructive con criticism from uh, from you guys before I go and and you know make a fool out of myself to <laughs> a library or a, a music soup or something. You know. Well, nobody um, in the industry says that to your face, right? Just so you know, they're all making fun of you behind your <laughs> right. back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's true. But We're a great test market. It is. It's great, and you know you take the feedback and you make improvements. But so many people, and I've seen it on the forums. I've seen it, you know, outside of the taxi uh, universe. People who, oh, I tried taxi. <laughs> you know, I submitted it, four it, things, it and not one of them for made me. It <laughs> right, or I got forwarded, but I never heard back. I'm like, well, how is that taxi's fault? They forward you. They they tell you pretty close. <laughs> you know, they're out of it, you know. They they forward you on, and then there, they're there's a conception though that or misconception that people have that if they're forwarded, that that means that they're hot on the heels <laughs> of a placement or a cut. Right. It does mean you're under consideration. Right. You're on the same desk as the other stuff, but yep. you know, man, I've had so many forwards where I never heard back. I mean, right. you know, but it's the the little gems when you do hear back that those are your ins. I do a lot of writing for places that I got in from a single forward. Right. Um, and now I write tons of music for these places, you know, even outside of taxi. And every now and then I'll get forwarded on a taxi one and it ends up at these same places because I don't know who it is. <laughs> right. you know, and they and call me up and they're anybody. like, hey, why didn't you just send this to me? I'm like, well, because I taxi submitted the brief first, you know. Right. But I think, you know, a lot of people really need to get it through their heads that you've said it before your music is a product and a business and if you want to sell your product you you need to try to make it appealing to the customers that you're going after and uh, the way you do that is by following you know the guidelines you guys have put out uh, the briefs that the libraries have and you know, I, I've had these conversations so many times where people say, well, I hate briefs because I want to write my music right. the way I want to write it. And I'm, like, well, and I'm then, not laughing out of uh, no. respect. <laughs> I'm laughing because you can do both. Right. That's exactly what I say. It's like, look, I, I don't, I've never submitted to a hip hop brief on Taxi because I don't write hip hop music, right. right? Now, maybe one day I'll venture out and try it if I've got some time. If you Matt Vanderbilt can do hip hop, anybody can. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny you say that because some of the people I see making like the hip hop cues and stuff, yeah. I would never in a million years guess. But, know. You know, it all started with taxi members and Oprah Winfrey. I don't know if you've heard <laughs> the phrase Oprah Hop, right? Yeah, but there were a lot of taxi members uh, that were not um, African American. They didn't grow up in the hood. Right. Hip hop was not part of their culture or their upbringing. And they learned how to make it for the purpose of TV placements, and Oprah ate it up, uh, right. a lot of it. And so the term Oprah Hop, Oprah Hop. <laughs> was born. But, you know, it kind of implies um, homogenous hip-hop, not right. really. Uh, by the way, I always love to say this when I can. There is a real need in the industry for very authentic-sounding, very straight, very gritty and I'm not talking about just the instrument sounds but in the personality and the character of the music the industry wants that kind of hip hop mostly right. for feature films and the guys making Oprah hop aren't doing it because right. they've become used to making the stuff that works in reality right. TV. Right, that makes sense. So yeah. for all you kids out there making the real <laughs> deal, take out the illegal samples, take out the profanity, <laughs> learn how to make money with your music. Right, it? yep, that's exactly um, it. So you said, da, 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 where is it? Okay, wish I'd known that it's possible to write music to briefs without compromising um, your art your artistic integrity at all. So let's talk about that all for right. a minute. Um, when you see a brief that says looking for um, orchestral hybrid stuff that would be suitable for film trailers, let's right. say, like an action adventure film right. trailer, and you sit down to craft that, I would think that the challenge would uh, be a test of your creativity, not putting you I, into a box that stifles right. It. That's exactly how I think of it, and you know, it's it's kind of uh, there are those certain rules for trailers. You know, the the number of acts, the number of seconds you want to kind of stay within. You know, right. We should uh, talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Sure. Yeah. yeah. But but outside of those few constraints, it is a, it's a real challenge, and you know, I, I I came up with a classical music background. 
And so I always loved writing that orchestral music, but I was very, uh, what's the word? I, I was very into melodies and musicalness, and you know, that's not a word, but <laughs> It is now, because it's now, been on it's taxi mine. TV. It's so, mine. That's right, copyright that. <laughs> so uh, I was very into having these flowing melodies and things like that that were very pleasant to listen to, and um, that's fine if you're going to sit and listen to music, but oftentimes, as you know, it doesn't work for for a trailer or something where it's right. got to be a little more subtle. Even if it's big and loud, it's got to have a subtle message behind it. And uh, so it was fun, actually, to kind of tame those melodies but still try to come up with something that was exciting to write but also fit into that trailer music box or that TV cue or whatever I was working on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was, it, was, it was almost like a fun challenge of creativity rather than crushing the creativity. I... I if you haven't written a trailer yet and you sit down and study trailers that have been successful and study the people who make trailer music successfully, yep. I think that that's like learning a, a higher level of the <laughs> art form because yes, you could sit down with great software and some talent and make great sounding stuff, but it just doesn't really have a purpose. I mean, right. not a lot of people knocking on doors going, I want to hear a bunch of orchestral stuff tonight <laughs> when I get home from work. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, you're not selling. You're not going to sell it. I mean, it's hard enough to sell any kind of music right. these days, but that especially. Right. I mean, but trailer music, I mean, you can get tens of thousands of dollars for right. a piece of music that lands in a trailer. Right. Um, and there's actually a decent market for selling trailer music too. You know, a lot of these big libraries, like you know, what Colossal and some of these places, they're, they they release it. those albums for yeah. sale as well. And they're, you know, Absolutely. I've bought a lot of them just as kind of study guides. Um, um, they're they're fun to listen to as well. But you know, the people that I know that are the music soups working on trailers, they they're never looking for. Uh, great composers they're looking for their definition i should restate that their definition of a great composer is somebody that can take their commercial because that's what they it's right. advertising they look at themselves as, as working at an advertising agency a specialized advertising agency yeah. and they're looking for composers that understand their world can this <laughs> person make music that sells a movie right yeah and yeah exactly that's an art form it is it's just a you know you just have to kind of run with it as its own thing which it is yeah. um same with TV cues; they're just kind of their own, their own little thing, and you and you just have to uh, kind of form your creativity around that. But uh, you know, it's a lot of fun, and you know, I, I think it's one of those things you, you kind of evolve, and you always are trying to learn. Well, I am. I I always know I can be better than I am today, and so I'm always trying to learn new things, take classes from other. Uh, trailer music composers. Uh, some of the big guys out there have done a lot of classes lately, like Trailer Music Academy, things like that, yep. where you know you watch these guys write these songs in four or five hours, and you're just blown away by what they're <laughs> doing. And you think, oh, God, I'm terrible. You know, I, I can never compete with this. But then you just Look at where you were it. five years That's ago when exactly you joined Taxi. It. I remember somewhere in the interview, <laughs> you said, I used to do like, um, I don't know, 10 or 12 pieces a year. Right. And now I forget where that highlight was, but you do yeah. like... Uh, I'm up in the 75 to 100 pieces plus. a year. Yeah. That, that's a lot. I do quite a bit now, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so let's talk about productivity. Okay. Uh, and, and by the way, um, we will play some of Randon's music shortly. And uh, I want you to know that he is married and has three boys. Not just three kids, but three <laughs> boys. So... I mean, I, I've spawned all girls um, and grew up with girls, but I do have two grandsons, and I can see how different boys are. For sure, yeah. A lot of work. So the fact that you find the time that you do um, is astonishing. Uh, tell everybody when you start your music work day. 4.30 a.m. Every day. Every day, seven unless you're days out a of, week. Unless you're out of town. <laughs> right, uh, right. I'm dying. I'm telling you, I've been here since Monday, and I am just aching to get back i you know obviously I'll send you back I, to the hotel yeah. with this bad boy you can get a little work done yeah i can i could hear that in a trailer sure maybe the next tron trailer <laughs> do a little, a little scratching with it yeah it's very versatile so, um <laughs> so yeah 4 30 until about 8 every morning wow that's my music time and my wife god bless her uh you know on maybe two or three evenings a week she she says it more often than that but i i don't take her up on it but she'll be like hey why don't you go do some music for an hour and a half or two hours before the kids go to bed and we're you know going to spend some time together there might be an ulterior right. motive but don't look. <laughs> yeah i i'm not questioning it 
<laughs> I, I listen for someone else coming in the front door. There's no one else. Coming. Oh, I didn't you know, mean I, it that no. way. I just <laughs> well, let's work for her. <laughs> no, yeah, she doesn't have to do anything for me. But no, it's uh, you know she does you know push me to have that little bit of extra time, which I need sometimes to catch up on deadlines. But but for the most part, yeah, it's all that block of uninterrupted time in the morning. That's so you originally wanted to be a rock star, and I remember a great story that you told in the interview that you were interviewing for like a, com- oh, a computer job, and during the interview they said, what do you want to be when you grow up, right. in so many words, and you went, a rock star. Right. And, and a couple of years later when you were leaving the company and they were having a goodbye party, the, the CEO or your yep. boss said, by the way, that was like this. Yeah, he was. I wasn't going to hire you. You know, <laughs> he was the the main engineering department manager. You know, and yeah. he's like, I only hired you because Michael, the, the, my manager at the time, he really liked you in the interview, despite your answers. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I, you know, I guess you could say uh, I'm honest to a fault. I I didn't uh, no I didn't give them honest. the answer they wanted, but it still worked out. So glad that it did. <laughs> so. You've gone from wanting to be a rock star, which is a common malady, mm-hmm. and uh, and you instead, it, what got you focused on doing um, orchestral stuff primarily? That's right. your main bag, um, right? Or, yeah, or so, doing instrumental stuff. Right, like instrumentals. Um, so I had always kind of, even when I was doing the rock star thing, I always wrote a lot of instrumentals just kind of on the side. I mean, not a lot, maybe one or two a year. Yeah, that's Either just for piano, <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, and sometimes we'd throw them on the albums that we were doing, the, the, the pop rock albums, you know, and we'd just throw an instrumental on there for fun or, uh, you know, I'd write instrumentals as gifts for like, you know, my parents' anniversaries oh, or nice. for my wife when I was trying to woo her and convince her to marry me, you know, um, things like that, but never with the idea of doing anything with them. They were strictly little one-offs for very particular reasons, but I, I did them because I loved writing the orchestral music. Um, do you remember ever watching like trailers or anything, I or never or, thought about or a score and going, "Gee, that's well, cool! I wish I could do score, that." Score, yes, because I was a huge Oingo Boingo fan ah. and Danny Elfman fan, and yeah. so he's that natural crossover between a rock star and a and a, a composer, right? Um, yep. So I loved his scores and his Nightmare Before Christmas, Pee Wee's awesome. Big Adventure. I mean, every score he did, you know, my wife and I loved, and we we had all of them. Yeah, all the movies. We he elevated every one of those films. He did. It was phenomenal. Sometimes the score is meant to be felt and not heard, but uh-huh. in Danny Elfman's case, it was like 25% of <laughs> the quality of the music or, really, or of the film was because of Danny Elfman. It really Elfman's was. Score. I mean, just phenomenal. And so I was a huge fan, and uh, that made me want to write orchestral music. And so that was kind of where the, the little side instrumentals came into play, and I just kind of played with it and had fun. And, you know, when I. Um, I did a solo album years after I was done doing music. I, my brother had moved to Germany, uh, and so we weren't doing our band thing. And I, I did my solo album that was all electronic rock kind of music. Uh, and when I was done with it, I was just kind of done. I, I finished it. It was kind of a, a diary in music, mm-hmm. and um, that sounded way too much like another word when I said diary in. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm not even it wasn't that, that bad. It was <laughs> it was an all right album. <laughs> it's all right. But uh, at this hour, <laughs> it's an adult show, not family television. Right, you're good. So I uh, I finished that, and um, right when I finished that album is when I joined Taxi. Actually, okay, because um, I'd su- I'd subscribed for the emails without paying. Right, just, right. Just so the you knew emails. the kind of stuff. That I kind of saw sought. these coming in. I saw this brief that was like. Um, I don't remember what the brief was, to be honest, but it was something in that electronic rock genre, and it, it was songs. It was after songs, and I was like, oh, look at that. This is like the first one I felt like I could pitch my music to. All right. And I was definitely still in that mode of wait for the brief that fits my music as opposed to writing music to fit the brief, right? Right. So I was waiting, 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 and then I see this, and I'm like, oh, what the hell? 300 bucks, I'll, I'll join tax, or however much it is. Sorry, I don't know. Yeah, the top of my- it's 300. <laughs> so I, I joined, I submitted, and I got a forward on it, which gave me a false sense of, of security because <laughs> oh, I thought, this is easy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next like 15 I got rejected on. So I learned my lesson pretty quick. But <laughs> after that, after doing that and seeing that it, you know, worked, I mean, I never got a call from whoever it was that was looking for it, but I, it, it made me really start thinking about the business side of it. And then I started watching all those briefs a little more closely and thinking, hey, look, they just want some drone music. That's not that far 
of a transition from doing this electronic, you know, Nine Inch Nails does drones and stuff all the time. I can do yeah. that. So I started doing that and then it just kind of evolved and uh, I started looking at those briefs and going, well, maybe I could do that. And I would try a few here and there that were a little outside of what I felt comfortable with and I would always get rejected. And I thought... We never I, reject anybody. <laughs> oh, sorry. We, we I, return their... I music. got returned. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Rejection is a dating term. That's on Tinder. Or right. Something. Okay. I got returned. <laughs> yes. Gracefully returned my music. And, um, you know, like I've mentioned several times, always with really good comments, very constructive and helpful. But it was when you said at the, the my first rally, you made a comment about don't try to go after every brief. Go after the ones at first. Go after the ones you really think you can tackle stuff that's in your then lane. expand later yeah and i was like well that makes sense why am i wasting all my money spending it on submitting to briefs that i'm like uh, maybe it'll fit you know yeah <laughs> and uh yeah after i followed that little bit of advice and just really ignored 90 percent of the briefs and went after that 10 percent that i really felt i could nail wow somebody then, actually <laughs> listened to my advice i'm so I, happy to well, meet you, you. <laughs> yeah so uh yeah after that i i noticed my forwards going from you know maybe five percent to 10 15 20 50 you know even 60 70 percent wow. i was like so at that point i kind of thought this is where i need to be right this is my lane and uh I'll expand later when I get to like a 95% forward rate. You know? Well, let's listen to something that's in your lane. Uh, do you All want right. to tell Bria what she should play first? Oh, let's see. Um, there is a track on there called uh, Death of a Hero, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. This was one I did just for an album, a library album. And um, I didn't have a brief. So I just got to do whatever trailer I felt like doing. Was, trailer so music they, was my brief, right? <laughs> so the library said, give us an album full of trailer music. Right. If we want it, you know, hybrid and orchestral and whatever you want to do. Okay. So I said, that's my kind of brief. So this one, I got to kind of step outside a little bit and just have fun with. You so. know, if things don't work out for you as a computer programmer, you could always go to work for Haynes because you're right. good at making briefs. <laughs> 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 You've been saving that for a while, haven't you? <laughs> Second act. Yep. <laughs> Build up.
<laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> Wow, that made me want to put on a Viking helmet with horns coming out of it and sing in the choir. Uh, that was incredible. You know, if you ever want to do that, I would love to make a video. <laughs> uh, Laura in our, on our A&R staff actually is a vocalist that gets hired to sing in films. And, oh, okay. And she's, I think uh, when Hans Zimmer did his live thing a year or so ago, she uh -huh. got to perform in that choir oh, wow. one night. That's and, cool. Uh, uh, she saw Paul McCartney's new album. Oh, wow. But yeah, but she regularly wears like the Viking helmet with the horns to work. And <laughs> we don't make fun of her because right, yeah. everybody's very sensitive. Sure, these yeah. Days. You can't make fun of people's horns. No, especially <laughs> Viking horns because they will hurt you. Right. Um, so let's talk about the three acts. Of, yeah. Because it's easy for us to assume that everybody knows about sure, it. And yeah. a lot of people probably don't. But. Um, Let's say you get new software and you can make really pretty pads. You go, wow, that would be really good for a film trailer. No, it wouldn't right. unless you understand the three acts. The tell three them, acts. Tell okay, them what they so are. generally you've got your introduction, which is most of the time going to be sparse, um, atmospheric kind of with a, a little bit of a building kind of And what's going tension. on picture-wise? Uh... Yeah, this is kind of where they're introducing the characters from the movie. Maybe, you know how a lot of those trailers show, like they kind of zoom in from like uh, the mountains or whatever, and they're kind of coming in and you don't even see any of the characters for that first 15, 20 seconds. It's kind of zooming in on that little medieval town or, or whatever it is, right. the barge out in the middle of the sea. And it's kind of that, that lead up to kind of get you interested hey what's gonna what's gonna go on here and so there's nothing really you know most of these trailer houses aren't gonna want a bunch of crap going on in the music it needs to be subtle they, they always want those low boomy you know subs going on down underneath it adds a little mystery and a little mystery and it. it gives them some sync points that's the, mm. the real critical thing is you know not just sticking those in randomly wherever the hell you feel like it it's got to you know put it on some measures maybe every two measures or four measures you right. know, whatever the tempo of your track is, um, to give them something to change that picture to every little bit, you know. They do love to cut on, <laughs> right. on those edit points. <laughs> right. Um, this thing should never be more than like 30 seconds, generally speaking. That um, intro section. Yeah. Okay. Um, some of them go to a minute, but most of them are like 30 to 40 seconds. Um, and I'm a big fan of, of breaks in between the sections because sometimes they'll want to take just the intro or just the middle section or just the ending. Uh, and if you've blended it all together like you normally would for a song, uh, they have a hard time chopping those. What so. about if you build the break in and you write a rest? You know, there's a big hit and then there's like a, a, a rest, a big rest, but there's a reverb tail hanging over. They That's can take hard. care of that. Yeah. Yeah. They'll okay. cut that and they'll just fade out your reverb or, or stick a different reverb on instead to, right. to carry it on out for however long okay, they want. Okay, so you don't have to worry about Yeah, that. yeah. That's usually good. if, um, I don't usually do full, like in, in that track we just listened to, I had a full on dead stop just for a second right at the very end it tailed out for a couple of measures i gave it a dead stop and then went on about my business for the ending um but if there's a tail there they can take care of that um, who's the british actress oh, she's got a giant like cleft in her chin oh from um, um oh, she's gosh, done emily em blunt? Yeah, emily blunt yes as i was listening to your trailer i'm going okay emily blunt and viking horns i could just so see her. <laughs> she she is she's great because she could be like in a romantic comedy right yeah and then be a viking right yeah <laughs> she can totally just whoop someone yeah right yeah. yeah for sure so so that's the intro um then a break if you so desire and you should and then what happens um, in the mid -section? then your midsection is usually a, a build-up of some kind you know you want to introduce your theme essentially okay. your maybe uh, a breakdown of your chords that you're going to use in your main theme later on um, but you know some introductions so just usually, like simple little arpeggios little or arpeggios something. or a lot of times it'll be like the spiccato strings you know just kind of right. lightly building 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 and for that next 30 seconds or so that's when you're getting louder louder you're adding layers maybe even introducing some percussive elements and hits so that they've got even more sync points so you're They're, telegraphing that something bigger yes, is coming. Yeah, you're, it's, it really is the, that's really the intro to the characters and, and that sort of thing. And, and So is that what's going on picture-wise? Yeah, picture-wise you'd see a lot of uh, the characters coming in. Maybe some of the dialogue is going to be overlapping this. You know, like, I'm trying to think of an example, but maybe like uh, if you took a look at the Robin Hood, the new Robin Hood trailer, you know, there's that build-up section and everybody's, 
got the dialogue on top of that. So mm -hmm. you can sense the music moving and building underneath you and all the characters are talking and they're building up the dialogue to the climax of what's going to happen in the movie, right? Like, are you Robin Hood? Oh, no, I don't know who he is. That kind of stuff, you know. And, do, you, uh, do you really yeah, like I don't, those I don't, green tights? <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I just saw a trailer for Robin Hood the other night. It's uh -huh. got the kid from... Uh, uh, British kid that was in the movie with the gentleman spies. Oh yes, um, Taron Egerton. Yeah, what's his I name? I don't know if that's like his name. Eggby or something. Yeah. Eggsy. Eggby. Yes, yes. Eggsy. She knows what she's talking about. She's. A we shouldn't young, try to guess. We should right. just go young straight. people. They know all the pop culture <laughs> stuff. Um, uh, but so, yeah, they're they're introducing that the, the story. So you've so got you've to gotta build the your... momentum and increase kind of the mystery and right. the suspense of something's coming, but at the same time, give them enough air that the dialogue... Right, that's kind of Because that's tough, you know? I it mean, is. And that's why you don't want those melodies I was talking about, where, you know, you got some big soaring string melody or something playing. I'm, I'm playing my air strings. Right. I'm sorry. I can't resist it, you know? That's why I don't let anyone in the studio while I'm writing, because I look like such a clown. But um, <laughs> you've got to, to build that without being over the top, and you've got to have that tension building. That's why you hear a lot of those... Kind of, you know, it seems generic, and a lot of composers don't want to use them. But those risers, you know, yeah. the, everything rising, you got to have that. That's what builds the tension, and it makes the audience know something else is coming. And, and so, what is that third section? And so, that, the third—that's your like theme. You know, you may, maybe have another break there, and then you come in nice and strong, right? And that's, what are you? What is the picture, and what are they trying to accomplish in the third scene right. of the trailer? So a lot of times, um, the scenes are faster moving, for one. So mm -hmm. we're at the beginning, you're having those things going like every four measures or something, you know, that kind of slow cut points. In the main theme, it's like every measure, you got these big hits going on, and so the scenes can just be cutting back and forth. I mean, you watch some of those trailers, you can hardly tell what's going on, because, right. you know... There's someone getting punched in the face. There's a head getting lopped off. It's just all it's going all on violence. so fast. It is all <laughs> violence, which makes for great trailer music. Yeah. And so it's all flying by. But it's, you know, if you really, you know, listen to some of this carefully, you hear that all of those things are cut right on big percussive hits and things like that in the music. It's all synced up perfectly. And not because a composer sat there and wrote the music to match the scenes, but because a trailer editor sat there and cut the video to match the music that they picked. So is that, uh, and we are just talking about one kind of trailer here, because right. there are, you know, like indie film, right, uh, coming yeah. of age trailers, right. and romantic trailers, and comedic trailers, and, and we can, you know what, we'll talk about that at the Road Rally, because I've got a trailer supervisor named Naaman Snell, um, who just knocked out of the park two or three years ago at the rally, and he's coming back, and oh, cool. he and I are doing an hour on stage together just talking about trailers. Oh, so nice. We will cover all those aspects. So going back to the big, like, action, you right, know, adventure, yeah. bombastic uh -huh. kind of stuff. Um, yeah, you're right. It's like uh, if there's not the arm of a Transformer falling off and hitting <laughs> asphalt. right. And it, what, what's boring. funny is when you really start paying attention, you'll notice there's not a whole lot of dialogue in that main section of the trailer. Right. You some screaming and some yeah, wailing. And yeah, yeah. That kind of stuff. But mostly it's the loud music and the sound effects that the, the trailer editor has popped on top of it. So it sounds so like they a trick. They actually, you know, I sometimes when I, I'm feeling cocky and I think I know everything about everything, <laughs> uh, I am a little surprised to hear that they will actually find a piece of music and cut picture to the music. It right. makes sense. Um, that's rare. That I mean, doesn't sure happen they, in TV and it right. doesn't happen in commercials yeah. very often. And sure, they you know the big guys are hiring a composer to write custom music for the trailer. You know, and that's a totally Maybe different less story. Less and less, right? I think. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's not hard to take a scene in a video editing and and make it a little longer, cut it a little shorter. You know, if they can find the music for, you know, one-tenth of the price of paying right. some professional composer to come in and write for it. Well, the quality of the stuff in libraries it's, because it's, of guys like you and the combination of, like, uh, Vienna Symphonic, which, right. um, you know, we, we had on the show right, on Monday. Last, yeah. Stuff sounds great, so... It does. I, I hate to say that it's going to take any food off the table for the trailer composers, but... It could. Right, it could. And the good news for those guys is they get paid so much for one trailer that they don't need to do 20 of them a year, right? Right. <laughs> and they're probably I'm sure also they see writing... I'm just like that, yeah. Brandon. 
<laughs> you hear that, guys? You don't need this business. <laughs> let, let some of the little guys have some of the food. That's chain right. Here, you were right? little at some That's point. That's right. Um, but yeah, then so you you go into that big section. There's not a whole lot of dialogue. It leaves room for your main theme, which you know they still generally don't want some super melodic theme, but at least some nice chords. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's funny. I mean, a lot of these places they have a certain chords even that they're looking for you know really yeah they'll, they're actually able to speak in musical terms a lot of them are yeah a lot of these That's guys are composers that are running these places right that have now elevated themselves to doing the whole doing thing the whole thing and so you know they'll be like hey you know it, it'd be really interesting if you tried this chord here on instead of what you've done you know <laughs> like okay you know that's amazing that they could do that because one of the things that we talk about um, amongst the staff when we're sorting out uh, briefs that come in here that become listings um, I mean there there there's some people making television shows right uh, that are musically inclined and they can say you know I I want something that's got more of a minor overcast to it right yeah because that'll set the tone of and that's great when they can give that kind of direction other people will just say you know I want something moody well moody (laughs) what does that mean (laughs) well intensely moody like something you know brooding or does that mean sad moody there's a range of moody Um, and even frankly if we get moody we're happy because a lot of people just go you know give me something like the bangles (laughs) <laughs> Great. Which Bangles right. song in particular? Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> that's funny. It, it's tough. I'm really heartened to hear that uh, the supervisors that are working on trailers can speak in, in yeah, the lexicon and, of and the Yeah, and you musicians. know, to be honest, I can't speak from the side of the music supervisors doing the trailer, but rather from the trailer houses working with them. Right. And every trailer house I've worked with or tried to work with... Um, has been very musically inclined. That's awesome. Yeah, and you know, to the point they're like, "Hey, this track sounds really cool, but you know, when you've got those spiccato violins going, it'd be really cool if you went to the natural wow. instead of the, you know." And they're like, Geez, "Okay, sure." That's <laughs> impressive. I'm, I'm really happy. right. Yeah. yeah, so it's kind of cool, and uh, but yeah, they they definitely know what they're listening for, and they they have that formula, but they still want you to try to be original within the formula. Um, that's the, what so, I call the 10, 10 to fifteen percent rule. Right. If people always want to do stuff that's like really pushing the envelope. Well, if you push the envelope enough, then you've pushed yourself outside of the envelope <laughs> to the point where you're unusable. So you right. got to recognize what the envelope is and just create a yeah. little bulge. That's exactly <laughs> it, right? Um, and you know, the with the trailers especially, there really is a format to that. I mean, that and that third act should be like twice as long as your short build up and intro. So really, you know, if you're talking in 30 second increments, you've got a 30 second intro, a 30 second build up, a minute long main theme, another break, some kind of drop, allow things to settle down. And then oftentimes you're coming back in with something, either a, a new ending, you know, a new climax that's short, like right? A 20 seconds, just big, yeah. big, 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 that's you think even it's bigger. Over, then it yes. scares the crap out of you. Right, even bigger than the climax that you just heard, you're like, Okay, now uh, we had tw- you know twelve French horns playing during that main theme, and it sounded huge. Now we're gonna go with sixty. You know, we yeah. need a hundred and twenty violins, and you know, five percussion sections, and you, you know, just make it ridiculous. What do they call that when uh, you've had the big um, crescendo and you've had the big climax, and then it comes back like oh, you did like the, the stinger ending? Yeah, yeah but it, it's it, is that a Technically, a coda you know, or what? Oh, so, well, like in, in the trailer world, they just call it the second climax, actually. But what about if, if it's the kind of just oh, goes, it's just bum, kind of ending. Bum. Yeah, they usually, I, I always hear them just still refer to that as a stinger ending. Really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, even and when they, it's subtle or even if it's like a big Bram kind of, you know, Hans Zimmer bang end. And they use that largely because they've got to roll credits. They're under, right. under contract for, yep. you know, like the actor's name, the cinematographer. They've got to be in the trailer. Yep. So that's what they do is they deliver the trailer. They give you the big impact. They sell you on the idea of going to the movie. And by the way, here are the people. Right. That's exactly it. And it's funny because a lot of times if you listen to these trailers at the end, there's that stinger where they, they flash, like you said, the, the actors or whoever, who are the director oftentimes. And then, like, just a little bit later, there's this real subtle kind of boom, you know? Right. And that's where they show the movie company's logo. Right. And it's almost all the time you see this. And, uh, you know, in talking with people, a lot of times the trailer editors are adding that little boom in at the end themselves. But it doesn't hurt to just put it there anyway. They can cut it out if they don't want yours. 
My um, wife just asked me that very question the other night. We were at a movie and uh, she asked, you know, why are there 27 logos either leading <laughs> into the movie or at the end? You know, who are these people? Right. Sil Silverton Films and, right. you know, Lady Tiger Productions. <laughs> it's like, honey, those are the people that write the checks. Right. Yes, that's right. <laughs> they, they're getting their shiz up there. Yeah, they want that name up there. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what they paid for. Um, okay, let's talk about. The difference between writing a film trailer and writing a TV promo. Okay. And let's stay in the same genre. So let's say it's an action adventure TV show. Sure. Sure. Um, are, are, are the timing parameters um, different? Is the structure any different, or is it you pretty know, much the same? It's very similar, honestly. Yeah. Although, usually with the TV promos, they're shorter. Obviously, they might be thirty seconds or sixty seconds. Usually, that that whole intro section can just go out the window. Right. You don't have that. There's not that enough time atmosphere. for a setup. Yeah, I mean, you're, you set it up and then the trailer <laughs> the ends, you know. No one's interested in right. that you'll TV the, show, right? You'll get the rest <laughs> on the next commercial So, break. you know, from what I've seen and from the ones that I've had placed, uh, a lot of them I actually wrote in that trailer format still. And then Because I, I was writing them as a trailer album and not necessarily for TV. Um, but they just used a, a clip. And it's mm -hmm. almost always that main theme section. Almost, you know... 90% of the time, it's that main theme that they use. Right. They don't want the stinger ending because there's no time for that either. Right. It's usually like this abrupt ending, you know, and it's and they're very specific about, you know, it's 29 and a half seconds. Do not go over 29 and a half seconds, you know. Um, we, your tail needs to end before 30 seconds. You know? It's funny how people, when we run listings that say, you know, you got to be out in 29.5, and I frequently tell people in the listings, it's because a computer in the world of TV, computers are pulling the commercial, inserting it, right. and then going out of the commercial back to... Yep. So it's not like some dude sitting there with a switcher <laughs> in his hand waiting... Oh, right, okay, I'll let it, I'll let it tail uh, out. <laughs> there it is, boom! It, it, so it right. will cut you off. Yeah, and um, it sounds really crappy if it cuts off right yeah. in the middle of this thing without, you know, <laughs> imagine you're watching a TV trailer and it builds up, builds up, builds up, and leaves you without the last chord. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of people really wouldn't care, right. frankly, but guys like us, would. I would drive me nuts if yeah. I heard that. And so, um, so yeah, usually, you know, if I'm writing for a brief that I know is for a TV ad or a TV show, it's usually going to be sixty to ninety seconds long. But that thirty seconds at the end, I almost always leave as a break and coming back in, okay. almost like a climax and second climax just so that they could take one or the other. Um, but but also, um, you know, most of the time when I'm doing an album for a library uh, that I know does TV, I might write it in that trailer format in case I get lucky and they, they land it in a movie. Um, but I also, most of them require 60 and 30 second versions of the songs um, that I actually write rather than just chopping the final audio files. Right. I'll usually write them, you know, as, I, as I'm getting ready to final mix, I'll just kind of copy paste, make a few changes so that I can still get the point across in the right time frame mm -hmm. without it sounding like a crappy edit where I just started an audio file right in the middle of a chord or something. Is, is there a, a tempo, a BPM that, kind of a range that's common? Yeah, I mean like 90 fits in really nicely, 120 fits in really nicely. Um, but, you know, I usually don't worry about it too much because you can always take your beginning and start it halfway through a measure or something and fade it in and, you know, to, to squish it into the 30 and 60 second versions. Did so. you happen to see the show that I did on Monday yet? Probably. I haven't watched it yet because I was, I was here. All right. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so I had Martin Tishi on. Right. Uh, I don't know if you heard his piece last year. At I the did, yeah, Valley, yeah. Across the Valley, which I just loved. Yep. I have confessed to playing uh, Air Baton as the conductor at <laughs> 10 o'clock at night in the office leading up to the rally. I, I listened to that thing like 10 right. times that night. Just love no, it. No, it's awesome. And, uh, what was, oh, because he is also um, the marketing manager, director of marketing or something um, for uh, Vienna Symphonic right. Library. Yeah. And they've come out with a new product, uh, which is basically... Oh, I saw I, that. It's like the, the all-in-one. Yeah, the called? smart... smart orchestra. See, look, she yeah. really does know everything. Well, she's forced to sit in here, so, you know, <laughs> if, she, if she were wearing headphones... I'm not even going to honestly try to think of anything anymore. I'm <laughs> right. just going to go straight over it. <laughs> uh, anyway, 
I checked that thing out uh, the next day at work. Uh -huh. It's incredible. I think right. it, it retails right now. It's on sale, I think, until tomorrow for $170. Yeah. And it's they're going to have it at the rally on sale. Um, it's for somebody, somebody as experienced as you, you don't really need it except that it's so great at laying out sketches. Right, yeah. You have an idea and yep. you don't want to sit down and think about all, putting all these things together to lay right. out your idea and maybe just putting it down on a piano isn't enough. Right. So you could basically sit down and play an orchestra that's just sitting there waiting yep. for you with everybody situated, you know, in the floor plan the way they should yeah. be. Uh, I, it is I think really it, cool. It's it's, it's super one of the cool. Greatest inventions yeah. for people like you that I've seen yet. Yeah, so yeah, it is. Job, and man. and they had um, so Berlin Orchestra, you know, the Berlin Instruments. Yeah. they had something very similar oh, with really? their Inspire series where you yeah. could play the whole orchestra, uh -huh. but it's also considerably more money. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, consider well, like yeah. I think at least double. Wow. Yeah, um, but both obviously just great products. But to be able to sit down and and do that is, you know, I'm still really. You know, maybe it's old school. I still do use a piano. Like almost every one of my projects starts out with a, a piano track. I remember you said that sometimes, uh, or not infrequently actually, that he will sit down and, and sing stuff into your phone. Oh, God, if my phone got out there, it would be so humiliating. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's all. The, all those actresses in Hollywood with the selfies felt that right. Way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what the hell were they it's thinking? It's me I humming mean... in some little you know four bar <laughs> thing that's supposed to be a violin, you know. Um, but yeah, that stuff is really cool. That you know, I think a lot of the aspiring composers that are starting out, or maybe within the last year, have such a huge advantage over others that have been doing it for a long time. In in a lot of ways, as far as the tools that are out there and available, it certainly makes the learning curve faster, right. and somewhat easier. It does, which I think is the thing that scares a lot of people because orchestral takes work. I mean, the fact that right. you have to sit down and noodle virtually, you know, virtually every instrument, at yeah. least every group of instruments, yep. uh, and, and you know, you have to understand what an or what every instrument in the orchestra does yes. in order to make them sound like they were played by humans that play yes, those instruments. Yes, exactly. And this tool, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are going to go, oh, you know, it's, oh, that's so crass. <laughs> but, you know, it does it for you, but it does right. it for you well enough that it gives you the satisfaction of being able to create something. Yes. It may not be good enough to compete with Hans Zimmer. Right. But it's... I'll tell you where I would use that is on a week like this where I'm out of town. Yeah. I could stick it on a laptop because I don't need my 40 terabytes of sample drives, you know. <laughs> no, not that many, but maybe eight. Yeah. Um, but I don't need to take a big rack of hard drives with me, you know. That's why I never take my music when I travel. I've got a little, a little keyboard I could take and a mm -hmm. laptop, but I don't want to lug around on my hard drives and risk damaging one. But to take something small like that that I could totally do sketches on like more than sketches i mean yeah. you really you know you could have finished ideas on there that you could then go home and and translate and turn into really cool stuff and frankly the sounds are the same sounds that you get in the big boy version right yeah so if you are doing something um that's relatively simple and you don't need the uh, dexterity and expertise that somebody <laughs> like yourself right. would have developed for somebody starting out i believe that it's a really good way because it gives you the satisfaction of completing something. Right, that's this for sure. This sounds like an orchestral piece. And I, you know, I should probably apologize to my wife right now because odds are that's going to be on my laptop when I come out <laughs> for the rally. <laughs> What's your wife's name, Erin? Uh, Erin, yeah. Yeah, Erin. It's Michael's fault. It is. It's entirely my <laughs> fault. Um, one of the things I highlighted from the interviews I wrote, it, it bothers me when I see taxi members uh, comment that they couldn't get their music past our screeners, yet they got deals for the very same music on their own. Uh -huh. Invariably, the reality of the situation is that the companies they signed with are often what I call lower tier libraries, let's say. That's so nice and polite. I know. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, it doesn't mean that they're horrible, but they're, they're like any type of company there are there are tiers yes you for can sure. go to a discount shoe store or you can go to Nordstrom okay <laughs> um, so uh, oh so do you have any opinion as to which strategy might be, be the better way to go um, the I'll put my music into a lot of catalogs anybody who will take it or do you recommend going with a, a small group of higher quality companies? right I definitely think smaller yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, I guess it could be different for everybody, but 
for me, like even with the small number of libraries I work with, which is, you know, I mean, I've, I've probably worked with maybe 17 or 18, but the ones I work with on a regular basis is probably three or four, wow. you know? Um, and so for me, especially with limited time, you know, if I were trying to work with 10 different libraries and keep up on briefs from all of them, I feel like I'd be giving kind of like, you know, half-assed versions of things yeah. to all of them. And instead of, you know, delivering a few really high quality products to a few good libraries. Um, and, you know, it, it's kind of the same thing with the instruments we were just talking about. You can buy, uh, you know, instruments that do one thing really well or a hundred things kind of crappy. You know, right. <laughs> you, you get what you pay for and these libraries get what they pay for or might pay for. <laughs> Twenty nine ninety five, baby. That's, That's everything exactly I need. it. So <laughs> I just really think that, you know, it's quality over quantity with this stuff. And I think the, you know, these these guys that are doing the big trailers, the, the really successful trailer composers are not working with a crap load of trailer companies. They're working with a few really top tier companies, you know, and it takes them longer to write these trailers and they, they can keep up on that. But, um, you know, I think even with TV cues, it's like uh, you find a library that's getting a lot of placements on reality TV shows or something like that that you work with. and you you write a lot of music in that vein for them and then if you got another one that does more trailers then you do that for them and you can really stay busy with just a couple of libraries so let's talk about um you know what i'm going to play a piece of music and then we're going to talk about you had some incredibly good advice bullet pointed advice about basically acting like a professional um once you're in the industry i'm going to find oh, those okay. uh, tell bria what Oh. She should play next. Hey, why don't we play the one uh, that Adriana did with me? Okay. Um, I think that one's called Liberator. Okay. It's going to get really big, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to bring up the volume. <laughs> probably explain I violated many of those trailer rules we talked about in this on case. this one because this was for a brief that wanted something longer and they specifically wanted a breakdown in the middle ah. it came back up. So they got a so double wide. <laughs>
I couldn't help but think at the end of that, just by coincidence, a couple of weeks ago, I was watching like 60 Minutes or something like that, and they were talking about cancer therapies, and there's uh -huh. a, a relatively new, it's been around for 10 years, but starting to come to the fore now, therapy uh, or treatment, uh, actually a cure in some cases for cancer. There was a little girl, it was like eight or 10 years old or something, uh -huh. and she had a brain tumor, and they literally opened up her skull and took a drop of, um, basically truncated HIV virus that doesn't have wow. a contagion in it. Uh -huh. And they drip that like a drop on the tumor itself. And it causes the tumor just to explode and die. You're it kidding. can't handle it. Oh my gosh. And, it, and this girl was back in school in 30 days. I mean, she was wow. essentially written off. She was going to die that like any week. And she was that's back cool. in school in a month. So I was listening to the end of that. And I thought, that's what the cancer cells hear when that drop right. of HIV hits. <laughs> you know, it's, that's it right there. I'm renaming that. It's yeah. not liver. It's not cancer cell. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can sell to a pharmaceutical right, yeah. company. <laughs> So you had some incredible advice um, in the beginning of part three of, of the interview that we did. And I'm going to read you like the first half of each of the lead in sentences and then have you elaborate. We've got quite a few of them to get through. So we're going right. to kind of go through quickly because I want to open the floor up for viewer questions. Okay. Um, so first thing, now, these are all things that um, Brandon talked about when I said, can you tell a reader some of the things that define professionalism? in the context of working with music licensing professionals. Because as we stated at the top of the show, it's not just making great music, right. it's being becoming a go-to person because they enjoy working with you. Right. So these are things that will help them enjoy working with you. Number one is if a pro gives you feedback on your music, Take it right? and graciously take it and say thank you for it. And, and don't argue, right? right? Yeah. Well, well, I don't agree Arguing. with you. Arguing. No, I did that for a reason. I really like that intro. That's too bad. Okay, well, next time I'll be talking to somebody else that right. doesn't argue with me. All right. Uh, number two, if a pro tells you that your music isn't quite what they're looking for, do not bother them. Right. Don't keep annoying them constantly. <laughs> well, what about this one? Well, what about this one? <laughs> hey, did you hear this song I did last week? You, you know, didn't like the fact that I flatted that note? What? Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, it, you know, I think a lot of that is knowing when to say, when some, you can kind of read when someone's just flat out not interested. Of course, in this industry, if they don't like you at all, generally you just won't hear back. Right. right. Uh, if you get something back that says, hey, that was pretty good. It's not quite what we're looking for at this time. That doesn't mean they want you to keep sending stuff. If they want you to keep sending stuff, they'll say, this isn't what we want, but it's close. Maybe try us again. I mean, I've had that so many times. Hey, this is really on the right track, but it's not quite there yet. Try us again in six months. Oh, okay. And then So I, they're not going to, because the inclination for many musicians would be, I'm this close. Right. I want it. So, well, tell me what I need to do. I'll, yeah, work on, I'll stay yeah. up all night and send you another one tomorrow. No, Don't do that. I, no, because I think these guys know that you, it's not going to be any better the next night or or three or four weeks later, it's going to be better six months later after you've written another 50 tracks. That's a great observation. And you've you actually, you know, made improvements. And, I, you know, I can think of two times that I contacted libraries, got told no, contact us again in six months, and six months later got in with the libraries. Wow. Um, because, you know, they told me what they didn't like about it and what they did like about it. And then for the next six months, every song I wrote for some other library, I worked on fixing those problems. And then I went back and said, hey, how close am I now? You know? <laughs> and so, you know, I think it's taking the advice, using the advice um, is a huge one. Yeah. Um, and then not trying again too soon. And, and, and when you have these conversations, are they via email or yeah, via television? Yeah, email. email. Okay. I, I, I've hardly ever spoken on the phone to any of these guys. You know? My father's 94 <laughs> years old, and he was uh, exclaiming to me rather loudly a week or so ago that those oh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren uh, never call. Right. And I said, Dad, my own kids don't call. Everything right. is a text. It's all email and text, yeah. yeah. I mean, now uh, we do get some video. The kids live out of town, and, and we'll get a, hey, fam, how you doing? A little short video. <laughs> right, thing, yeah. You know? Right, yeah. yeah Going so out to dinner my, with my friends, uh, just thinking about you. What's the name of that app? My, my What's that app? No, it's a it's a video one. Marco Polo. Oh, have you it's seen a it? little short videos back and forth. And my wife and all of her family and everybody they use this, and it's like video text messaging. And so, you just record your little message, and it, it, you just have conversations back and forth, and it tracks all of the conversations, wow. all these little video clips. It's pretty cool. I you know, no one ever wants to talk to me, so I don't use it. But 
My wife uses it all the time. It's really cool. So my wife is is very bad with texting with her. Apparently, I mean, you wouldn't know it to look at her fingers, but apparently, she has really fat fingers. <laughs> She's very famous in our family and circle of friends for sending texts where everybody goes, "What?" <laughs> she doesn't look right. Typos <laughs> everywhere. Like every word has typos in it. So I may have to introduce her to Marco right, Polo yeah, and save a work. lot of translating time. Yep. Um, Another one that you mentioned was uh, when you've sent out music for review, do not send emails asking. Oh, asking for their thought, you know, their what they thought of it. You yeah. Know, you know, hey, can you let me know what you thought of that song I sent you last week? And Everybody wants to do that, though. That's right. We get that question from members all the time. Shouldn't I do follow up? And my answer to that is I can't think of three times in my 40 year career that anybody ever got a deal because they followed right. up. Right. No. Oh, no. yeah. Yeah, shoot, man. That's right. I listened to your stuff. I loved it. I want to oh sign it. I just gosh, forgot I can't to call believe you. I forgot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It doesn't happen that way. Right. I mean, literally, the only time you should ever follow up is if they tell you, like I was just saying, follow up in six months. Yeah. And you better believe I did not send another song until it was actually closer to eight months later. Well, I was knowing you, like, I, was, I was thinking it'd be like five months, well, 20, I, 29 days. At six months, now, I'm telling you, I was like just, <laughs> you know, biting it, you know, trying to restrain myself from uh, oh. from sending something. But I was like, no, I really want to make something. I've, I've hit the six month mark. Now I want to write something new that I feel is really on And top when you go it. back and look at what you sent them six or eight months oh, ago, you probably cringe, right? It's so, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I might have like 500 tracks in my you know ASCAP registry or whatever and I bet 350 of those are cringe worthy you know wow. I, I mean they've still gotten played on some TV shows and stuff but yeah I, <laughs> that'd be a great name for the library I, cringe worthy <laughs> <laughs> I can sign all sorts of stuff <laughs> maybe, maybe I only take the uh, returns right, the taxi returns. <laughs> we can run that listing for you um, <laughs> when a pro does contact you for your music and you deliver it, don't bug them with emails asking about the progress. So uh, yes. uh, define what that means further. So, for instance, you sign with a library, they take some of your songs, and maybe they even ask for more. You know, you, you give them a bunch of music. Don't go sending emails saying, hey, have you gotten that placed yet? Ooh. I mean, you know... It, well, for, for one, nine times out of ten, they probably don't know when these things get placed. You know, they probably find out about the same time as you do when it shows up right, on their ASCAP report. Right, to find or ASCAP. Right, right yeah, yeah. Or you, BMI. Yep, yeah. Or CSEC. <laughs> when their pro tells them, I, I'll encompass go. everybody. Good job. But, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times they don't know because they've done some blanket licensing for the whole library. So if, if ABC slaps one of your songs on a promo for a bunch of shows you'll probably find out before they do oftentimes because it just these guys just used it and wrote their uh, cue sheets for it and it's not like you know these music supervisors are always going to call and say hey i'm using your track on on this today if they've done a blanket license they have no need to say they're using right. it. they've already paid for it so and who wants to take the time especially like let's take the case of somebody who's working on a reality show first of all it's the editor laying in the vast majority of the music not the soup the supervisor says, here's the bin to get the music from, and yes, you did a good job. Now let's show it to right. the showrunner. Yep. But uh, they're not going to, when they've got 75 to 100 pieces of music in an episode, they're not going to reach out to everybody <laughs> and go, hey, dude, guess, guess what? what? We <laughs> used 12 seconds of your music. Right, that's exactly it. I mean, even even in the big trailers and stuff, I, I'm i friends with several composers that are way above my level, uh, you know, and social friends. And... I see them posting things. They're like, hey, I just got this late confirmation. They used my song on this trailer in like February of 2017. And that's for a movie trailer. Like, wow. Most of the time you think they would know right away. But uh, yeah, even at that level, sometimes these guys don't know. So there's really no point in contacting your library and asking if it's being used yet. I mean, you're just going to annoy them and they're not going to ask you for more music, you know. Uh, let's do one more of these and then we'll start taking some audience questions, assuming you guys have some. If not, I've got plenty more. <laughs> um, uh, number seven on your list, you said, I find in business it's always good to be grateful. And I've got to say, you know, you guys may not know this, but um, one of Brio's many jobs here is printing out um, feedback that we get uh, about the screeners, uh, compliments, and you know, I'm coming to your house to, well, whatever. Uh, but I she, saw you when you were listening to my song last yeah, night. Right. <laughs> well, we used to have a camera in the screener room. It's oh, actually God. still up in the ceiling. Is it really? Uh, wow. But we had 
one of the screeners was going through a divorce or had a problem with an ex-boyfriend or something. And so she was getting uncomfortable with the fact that that camera was on right. in the room. And, and taxi members would sit there and watch the screeners really? working. And, and I mean, it was <laughs> that actually, does seem a little awkward. It, it was kind of cool because on one hand it validated, look, we have real people. Right, there's humans here. doing this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, um, some people would get a little carried away and send emails. I saw this guy only listening for 30 seconds, and I know it was my music. Are you serious? How do you know? Wow. You couldn't see the computer screen because I just know, damn it. <laughs> right. Okay. So anyway, at some point we had to un Your hair it. looked nice while you were listening to my song. <laughs> <laughs> Standing on end. Um, where was it? Oh, so the reason I was saying this is that you've always been really good about sending little notes, posting things on the forum, the screener shout out section of the taxi forum, which is at forums with an S, forums.taxi.com. Right. Um, and the stuff that you post there actually gets copied, pasted, printed out, and goes <laughs> on a wall in the kitchen area oh. <laughs> for, for the screeners to see. And you know what? Um, I can't say that any of them would say, you know what, it's it's that guy again, so I'm going to forward his music because he's always grateful and sure, always yeah. nice. They're, they're not going to make a determination based on that, but it makes them feel good about the job that they're right. doing. It makes them feel like, you know, I, in some way I'm contributing to elevate this person's life. Right. So that's nice that I you mean, do that. Don't, I mean, I just look at it like don't... It, all of us have a job, even if we're professional musicians and we don't have a day job, you mm -hmm. know? Everyone has a job that they do, and I can't think of anyone that doesn't want to be appreciated for their job, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. no matter what you're doing, uh, you know, a thank you goes a long way. And I, I someone thank Bria for you, kicking me under the table right. all the time. Yeah, she exactly. No, but I, I you know, I, I just grew up that way, and well, you, you were know, raised you well. Your parents did a good job. Appreciate people, you know. It's it's there's not enough of that in the world. Right? Yeah, it really isn't. I and you know. Having worked at many places throughout my life, I you know some places appreciate it more than others, and you know it really stands out when you work for someone that appreciates it, or like for for you guys, you know you're yeah. doing all this stuff for all these people. When people appreciate it, it not only validates the service but also makes everyone feel a little more like doing it, right? <laughs> Look, just to show you. That guy actually sent me something that was laminated. <laughs> uh, that was Steve uh, Steve Archdeacon uh, sent me a, a copy of his CD and laminated. Oh, thank you. Nice. Note. Can't remember who this one was. Oh, this is from Steve as well. Uh, but you know, I save these things. Um, I really do, and uh, I appreciate. Sorry, I'm 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 a slacker. Apparently, I just <laughs> send emails. But <laughs> I'm actually I'm looking over your shoulder to see if I can find. Um, uh, Phil, famous record producer, Wall of Sound, uh, Phil Spector. Um, I get Christmas cards from Phil oh, really? Spector, even from prison. <laughs> I've got some sitting like two feet behind you. Now that's when you know you're special. Um, so do we have any questions coming in from the... the yeah, I have a couple queued up, actually. Okay, let's hear them. Um, so question one is, uh, what sample libraries do you use? Ooh, that's a great question. Uh, what sample libraries do you use? This is a humiliating question because I am... You're a whore. I, I am. <laughs> or a gear I slut or whatever. I am a gear slut. I, <laughs> I was a gear slut back when we had to buy synthesizers and hardware, and it's just gotten worse with software. But software is a little cheaper, isn't it? <sighs> well, when you only buy a few, yes. I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I have a real problem. I, I've been talking to other composer friends about starting a Facebook group, like a support group, you know, like uh, Virtual Instruments Anonymous, because it's a problem. And when these companies announce their next product, I think, oh, well, I've got to have that. And look, it's on an intro sale, you know? Right. I can't afford to pass it up. It's only three ninety nine now. It's going to be eight ninety nine in a month. Uh, so uh, mostly, though, um, I'm a huge fan of Spitfire um, orchestral libraries. So I, I use, uh, if I'm doing more or orchestral, less hybrid, I almost exclusively use the Spitfire um, orchestral libraries. Uh, if I'm doing the hybrids, like what we've listened to tonight, um, the first track we listened to used uh, the cinematic studio strings. Mm -hmm. Those are phenomenal. I mean, and they're not that expensive either. They're a great string library for doing hybrid especially. Um, also used a little of the Hans Zimmer strings from Spitfire, uh, which are not cheap. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but um, so Spitfire, Heaviosity, kind of the the normal the normal groups, you know, um, some eight do. Um, but when it comes to orchestral Spitfire, um, I love the new brass from Heaviosity. The Forzo brass is amazing. Um, drums. What do I use for percussion mostly? Gosh, it's such a, a mixture of all sorts of things. Uh, definitely Heaviosity comes into play. Spitfire also comes into play with percussion. Um, I use 8DO's percussion a lot. Keep Do you forest. buy because <laughs> of the brand or do you buy, you know, like the seven day time bomb trial? Oh, And no, try it and know, go, wow, this sounds great. In context, I'm gonna buy most it. Most of the stuff I buy doesn't have a trial. Okay. Like the vast majority of it doesn't have a trial. You would think they would. I know. It's like, you know, don't you want to test drive that car? Yeah, because there are times when you've just spent like $500 on a library and you play it and you're like, oh shit, that was a mistake, well, right? Why wouldn't they give you a trial? Are they afraid of getting hacked? I think it's the cracked? theft problems. Yeah, yeah. it is. Because um, that's a bummer. Who wants to spend five hundred bucks? <laughs> right. To, you know. So, I, so for wow. that reason, I do tend to gravitate toward the companies I trust. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, uh, I've never really been disappointed with you know a Spitfire purchase or a, a Heaviosity purchase. And so, when they come out with something, I'll listen to their demos more than anything. I'll listen to their demos and and loudly. And really, mm-hmm. kind of try to put it into context of what I do. And, what are your main see. monitors in your control room? Um, my main monitors are my um, Atom Audio. Okay. They're the A7Xs. Those are nice. I really like them. You know, I worked for I don't know twenty years on a little shitty pair. Sorry, crappy. Are the kids watching? <laughs> no. <laughs> I you know software people and composers have foul mouths. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. I've been good though so far. Yeah. Um, I'm impressed. I use these. Uh, Alesis, the little cheap like Alesis monitors for years, and they were fine. I got used to them. Once you know what you're mixing on, yeah. it's you can do all sorts of stuff. Wasn't I think it was the Russell, the president of Alesis, left and formed Adam. Oh, did I kind of oh. think so? Because I remember he and I became friendly like in his last year or uh-huh. two at um, at Alesis. And it's one day he came to the office because he had moved to Santa Barbara and he had a pair of Adam monitors uh-huh. in the trunk of his car that he was going <laughs> to give me. And then he got about two thirds of the way back to Santa Barbara and he called me from uh, the car and went, "Damn, I forgot to give them to you. I never heard from him again." Oh, that's so too it's bad, the old they yeah, are awesome. Yeah, Russ, um, sure you did. Yeah, I used to use um, Dyn Audio. I really like. I had some of the BM fives that are brilliant monitors or BM sixes. Uh, those I liked. I blew one out and couldn't find a, a pair that day and I was right in the middle of a project wow. so I went out and I knew I really wanted the Adams and they were there in stock at Guitar Center uh, and so I, I took a listen to those and just yeah they're, but Aaron's cool with all your purchases because now you got money coming in well that, it helps yeah. yeah you know to be honest she was really cool with it even before uh, so I, I had no complaints there but I just feel less guilty about it now because <laughs> <laughs> it's paying for itself. <laughs> All right, next question, please. All right, um, you mentioned courses. Any suggestions? Yeah, uh, you know, actually, this is a new favorite of mine because I just took it this summer. And even, you know, I thought I was doing pretty good this the beginning of the year. And then I took this course and realized how crappy I was. And it As a composer? Really, yeah, and it, <laughs> well, specifically trailer okay. composer. Like, I'd taken some other courses, and there's some good ones out there, and you know, the format and all that kind of stuff. But this course, uh, it's through Trailer Music Academy. In fact, if you, you can just go to my website, I've got a link right there to it, uh, okay. randonpurcell.com. Um, so I've got links to the course and to Trailer Music Academy on there. But the course is taught by uh, a, a big trailer composer, Daniel. I'm not even going to say his last name because I know I'll massacre it. Uh, beige, beige born something like <laughs> that. <laughs> anyway, Got me. he has done some amazing trailers, yeah. Planet of the Apes, and some really cool stuff. Uh, really cool guy too. But he um, he teaches this course that is start to finish a song that he had no plan when he started the course. He he starts with this blank canvas and has this video recorder on, and he's just messing around. He's like, well, usually I start with the piano and just try to find some chords, and and he kind of goes through that. And by the time he's done with this something like twenty video session he's got this phenomenal huge monster trailer and you've seen every single step as he goes back and reworks things or tries new things uh, you see all the sample libraries he's using uh, which 
is way less than I bought, so I realize I've gone way over the top. Um, yeah, I mean, just it's a brilliant course. How it much really is, is it for the full couple hundred course? bucks for the okay. for the advanced? It's like a hundred bucks for the basic and two hundred for the advanced, which gets you. Uh, I think it. I think the advanced gives you a few extra modules that expand on like doing good brass and strings and whatnot. I should try and um, get them for the 2019 road. Oh, it'd be awesome. Have them create a, a trailer from yeah, scratch on stage. Yeah, for real, it would be cool because he's a cool guy and he's an amazing composer. Does he live here? Um, no, he's over in Europe. Oh, then yeah. he can't come. To he can't come. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm not uh, yeah, over you, first class from Europe. Anyone wanting to do a trailer should really, I honest, really highly suggest that course. It's really, it's fun too, actually. By the way, um, I think you're the first person I'm telling this to. We have um, the number one music supervisor from Australia and New Zealand oh. who does tons of TV commercials and shows and stuff, and he owns the largest. Uh, music supervision company with other supervisors working. He's coming to the road rally. Oh wow! Speaking of buying plane tickets from far away, <laughs> he, he will be at the road rally, which is oh, coming right up on November first wow. through the fourth here in Los Angeles. Go to taxi.com and check out the link at the top of the page in the top nav that says convention. Yeah, or, or go to taxi.com/rally. Taxi.com/rally. Uh, another question for Randon. Um, I assume your tracks need to be maxed out with limiting. Do you put a brick wall limiter on your master out? Uh, generally, oh, no. Hang on, I want to repeat the question just because okay. I was. You can't really hear her, even though she's oh, projecting okay. nicely because of microphone rejection. So the question is, do you use a brick wall limiter on your stuff? Right. Um, so it it kind of depends. Generally speaking, no. Um, you'll find when you're working with different libraries they want different things like i i have one library i work with that kind of wants already mastered mm -hmm. material in which case yeah I'll, I'll slam all sorts of plugins on my final chain to get it to be really loud and competitive with what's out there on the market um but carefully too because i don't want it to sound like this flattened pile you yeah. know just mush but yeah i'll um you know i use the the isotope um, mastering suite to kind of give it that end polish and a few other plugins from you know Universal Audio I use a lot of the UAD plugins um, but generally uh, most of the places I work with do their own mastering and so they want like 10 dB of headroom on every track mm. so those ones I almost hate going back and listening to you know they'll show up in my iTunes or something on random and I'll be listening to like some Hans Zimmer or something he's all big and loud and and then I can barely hear mine when it comes on, you know. Oh, wow. <laughs> or the other way, I'll be crank it up to hear mine, and then Hans Zimmer comes on and blows my speakers out, you know. So uh, if you're doing it, uh, I would suggest if you're writing music that isn't is to be pitched, yeah. Rather than for a library, then yeah, you'd want to crank it up and have it be loud because you know if your song sounds you know five ten dB quieter than Absolutely. the other ones on their desk, they're gonna not pick it. You know. <laughs> and it's not like they go, oh, it's soft, I'm not picking it. It's just a thing. If you're in the room, you understand this. I've been in like, you know, A&R meetings as right. VP of a major label. And it, it everything always sounds a little slow and a little pitchy anyway. And you're, you find your deodorant not really work or your antiperspirant <laughs> not really working well. And if the stuff is soft, that's the kiss of death. Right. It's like, inevitably, they will play you. Every A&R meeting starts out with the VP of A&R going, check this out, man. This is the latest thing I found. Right. And they play it, and it sounds amazing. And then they put your thing on, and if yep. it's, you know, like 10 dB quieter. Forget it. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, perception is everything, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, if you're pitching music, I definitely say try to crank it up. I mean, don't limit it to the point that it's crushed and all your dynamics are gone and it sounds terrible. But if you know what you're doing with a limiter, uh, you know, go ahead and throw some compression and some limiting on there and get your... And it's you not know. not the same kind of limiting you would use on a pop record. No. It's different. Yeah. So you've got to really study the genre. Right. And, and I'm no mastering learn. engineer by any means, but I at least know enough to not totally screw up a track. Right. Completely. <laughs> uh, you know, there's there's a plug-in... Um, it's a UAD plugin, but it's also sold by itself. It's the uh, Oxford um, Inflator. Yeah, that's a really cool plugin to give you a, a a nice limiting compression signal boost without a bunch of artifacts. Right. And if you don't know what you're doing, there's only like three knobs on it, 
so it's it's easy to use without completely screwing up your mix. So one of the more notable mastering engineers in Los Angeles, uh, many years ago, we had a band named Bob Goblin that got a record deal um, through a taxi relationship with I don't know, Universal, Interscope, I don't know, one of, one of the big labels. Anyway, MCA Records. And the band invited me to go with them to the mastering session for the album because they knew I was a retired engineer okay. and they wanted a spy in the room. Uh, it, when I walked in, the mastering engineer knew who I was. Oh, so, nice. So my cover was blown. Did you say, don't you know who I am? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just walked in, shook his hand, he goes, oh! And, and he knew that I'd worked at Criteria the whole thing. Right. So uh, anyway, he when everybody else was out of the room, he said, you want to know what the secret sauce is? And I went, yeah. <laughs> and he said, check this out. He would literally go, the master was on half inch two track analog, if I remember correctly. And he went out of that playback machine into the input side of an Ampex two track tape recorder and then out of the Ampex two track. So just in and out, right. but it went through right. that, the electronics. And he said, that's my secret sauce. I don't put anything that's else on hilarious. it. No EQ, no limiting, no nothing. <laughs> so the guy charged like top right for like, I need everybody to leave the room. <laughs> right. Well, nobody ever knew anyway, unless you were an engineer right, yeah. that was like, you know, hovering over and watching which, which patch points it was using. You wouldn't know. I was shocked that he told me because that's, that's kind hilarious. of a dirty little secret, you know? Yeah, and now I'm thinking I've got the the plug-in version of that from UAD. Oh, there you go. But I I do use that quite a bit on um, on all my strings and brass actually. Well, he pegged the meters pretty hard, yeah. and it sounded better. It you know it does, and I run things through it pretty mildly actually. But even when I can't hear it right off the bat, when I hear it in the mix, I'm like, you know, it just has a little bit of a warmth and yeah. and width to it that it didn't have before. It's, it's a cool plug-in. All right, another question. Um, do you treat your room? Yes, actually. <laughs> he walks in, here's some candy, yeah. here's a martini, <laughs> and here's five bucks. I for treat it to time. a crap load of coffee, I'll tell you that. <laughs> no, I, um, I, I do actually. My, my last house, I really went over the top and gutted the whole room and like, it, the thing was like a, a quiet room. I mean, yeah. it was almost scary. I couldn't hear the kids screaming on the other side of the door. Um, <laughs> and Aaron thought you were right, yeah. for, for mixing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but a boom. No, it's for mixing, babe. I promise. <laughs> I'll be back in a little while. <laughs> that was when our kids were young. But, yeah, didn't um, you say one of, your, uh, one of your sons cried for the first six months of his life? Yes. So I didn't have that room during those six months, though. Oh, God. <laughs> He's a anyway. blessed soul now, thank goodness. But... um. <laughs> Yeah, so my my new house that I'm in now, we've been there for four years, and I just finally got around this last year to ripping it down and, and treating it and everything. I didn't go over the top, but I did, you know, put in, you know, um, with the drywall, the green glue and all that kind of stuff to yeah. kind of do a little extra. Um, you know, I, I, I built, you know, I, 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 I'll do things myself when I can. I, all my acoustic panels in my studio I built because they're like 400 bucks a piece and you can build them for 25, yeah. you know. So um, you just took fiberglass bats and yeah, put like it the, on, the rigid fiberglass, yeah. you know, yeah, and stuck it, it into a wood side frame. Out. Yeah, and you know, I'd wrapped them in canvas uh, or in um, burlap, right? Um, and then my dad's this awesome watercolor artist, ah. and I thought oh, it would be so cool. So I persuaded him to let me wrap them in canvas instead. Yeah, and then he painted musical themes on these things nice. in kind of an abstract form. Wow. So I've got these awesome paintings that are worth probably more than my studio, and they're <laughs> also treating the room at the same time. So I don't go over the top, but enough to, you know, I pay attention to things like, I, I did a brick wall behind my, you know, that I face, kind of right. a faux brick wall that's really super porous. Um, just to avoid reflections, things like that. Just really subtle things that don't cost a fortune. Right. Um, it's more common sense than it is sitting down reading a book about uh, you know the, the physics of acoustics. Yes. If you understand the basic physics of acoustics, right. and you know to not do things like put a pair of monitors on right on the desk, right up against a wall, <laughs> right. and, yes. and and not put anything that will absorb bottom end underneath right. the yeah. surface, then you're in trouble. Exactly. But if you do know those simple things to do, that it, usually it, solves a big yeah, problem. Yeah, it does. You know, like if you've got a reflective floor, like a hardwood floor. Yeah. Put something on your ceiling that's soft. You're just trying to keep things from bouncing more than once. Yeah. It's kind of that's kind of my rule is if it can bounce more than once, it's a problem. So, you know, 
if I've got something bouncing off this wall, I want to have something uneven behind it on the other wall. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. I, I I'm no special engineer on this stuff, but like you said, it's kind of common sense. You know, you would think, and you would you would be surprised what a couple of of acoustic panels for twenty five dollars a piece will accomplish. You know, thank it's, God for um, stiff fiberglass bats. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, we got <laughs> time for one or two more. Um, how many tracks are your orchestral works usually? Oh, that's a good question. Um, how yeah, many tracks? Yeah, so like those ones we listened to tonight, um, probably between 65 and 85. Um, but, I mean, to be fair, you know, you hear these big hits and stuff. That right. might be like eight tracks, just layered drums, you know, from different libraries and stuff. I n I'll never have a single library drum hit playing by itself, ever. It's It's always got... A bunch so that's the beauty of the world we live in now is that you can do that so quickly yes. so easily yeah, I mean I remember you know back in the 90s when we were doing these albums and uh, electronic music we'd go into the studio and they're like well we've only got 24 tracks so you've got 40 in this song we're gonna have what can we combine you know what yeah. two instruments sound close enough together that we can combine and it was always this fight and then you're like mixing and going oh crap we just panned those on the same side now we got to dump those again and right yeah it was crazy to go from that to this oh i've got 180 tracks in this song you know and <laughs> but yeah I, you know i think for something big and epic you're going to have anywhere from 50 to 80 tracks generally speaking but a lot of that's just like i said special effects you know you might have five riser tracks and you know 15 or 20 percussion tracks, uh, you know, and then each section of the orchestra, with excluding the woodwinds who hardly ever make it into a trailer. <laughs> um, poor, poor woodwinds. You know, every now and then I, I usually mix some bassoons with my cellos just because yeah. I feel like I need to use that freaking woodwinds library that I paid for. But mom, don't make me learn <laughs> how to play bassoon. I know. But, I but, love the bassoon, personally. You know where I use the bassoon, though, is if I'm writing a creepy song. I love, uh, and woodwinds in general, woodwinds are so awesome for scary music. Danny Elfman uses them oh, all the time. Oh, he's a genius with woodwinds. Yeah. If I could use woodwinds like he uses them, they'd be in every track I use, or I write. I, I but can't he's say kind of, Yeah, he's kind Between of like uh, Woody stuff. Allen's clarinet and Danny Elfman's bassoons, yeah. like, how can you not love woodwinds? Right. Um, do we have enough time for what we do? One more. Yeah, one more. Don't have any. Oh, we don't yeah. have any more. Okay, well, that's well, good. we didn't have time for one anyway. Yeah, we've got about <laughs> we got about thirty seconds left. Uh, oh, here's a question: the thing and use more than one monitor. Oh, well, uh, oh, like like visual oh, monitor, probably right. Yeah, um, I'm guessing either that yeah, or they like mixed everything monitor. in monitor with one or a tone. <laughs> That'd or something. be awesome. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do use uh, dual monitor setup for my video. I used to use one big monitor, which I actually preferred, uh, and then it died. It was one of those big Apple monitors, you know? Yeah. And it died, and when I went to the store to get a new one, they had gone up in price like 500-fold. And so I didn't feel like spending $1,500 on a monitor. Uh, so I went and bought a couple of, you know, 28-inch monitors or something like that for, you know, a few hundred bucks each. The guy who builds uh, our website, the back-end stuff on our website uh -huh. that you guys never see, um, lives in Nashville but he comes out here to work sometimes for a week at a time on our stuff and he parks himself in the conference room and he bought a 55 inch monitor at Costco <laughs> and, and then shipped it back to Nashville to cost him like 400 bucks or something <laughs> to ship it back to Nashville and then he came back out two months later had to buy another one it's like dude why'd you just leave it here so right. that's why you will see a 55 inch monitor sitting around here somewhere that's funny um, yeah I think I would I, I prefer one monitor I, I tend to get windows stuck in between the two monitors sometimes, yeah. and it's like you can only grab the little edge of it to drag it out of the way. Oh, I hate when that happens. Yeah, and yeah. so I'll have like some plug-in trapped in that little monitor limbo. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, let's wrap it up. Also, I want you guys to know I'm not going to do a show this coming Monday. I was going to, and I'm just looking at the amount of work that I've got to do on the road rally. Um, we're so close to publishing the ballroom schedule. I've, I've really got everything locked down. But at this point in time, I'm dealing with things like today somebody said oh i really don't want to do it at that time because my dog won't like sitting in your hotel room michael for that <laughs> period of time so now i have to reach out to two other people that are on the panel after her and ask them if they mind going 
before that one, all because of a Yorkshire Terrier. So I'm dealing with those final issues, but I can tell you we've got an extremely good complement of people uh, and extremely good panel topics going on in the Grand Ballroom this year. Very, very excited. Uh, registration is still like way over what it was last year. Um, so register quickly and get your hotel rooms quickly because I haven't checked for a week and, and we were probably at 80 or 90 percent capacity at the at the hotel uh, when we hit capacity on our discounted room block then you guys have to start buying stuff uh, at more expensive same rooms for more money that's just the way the hotel industry works and we don't want you to have to do that so go to taxi.com slash rally if you are not a member yet and you're watching this go to taxi.com and become a member it's 300 bucks a year with that 300 bucks you get two passes to the best music convention on the planet earth bar none absolutely it's that good yeah tell them I about mean, absolutely the, the i'm not exaggerating is, no right? the rally is like the best thing ever i Thank i you. absolutely love it i was so bummed the one year i missed it since i joined um and it won't happen again because i've learned <laughs> my lesson right uh, and i thought the one year i thought well i'm too busy you know i've got too many things going on and i was like no you know i gotta go and I, I went again let's, just this last year, right. hanging out with friends and meeting new friends. You know, I've done some collaborations this year that I wouldn't have done without that. And right. it's just awesome. I, I can't say enough good things about it. Thank you. So, a, yeah, the, the rally is a must. It's, I mean, you can go to other conventions that probably won't, you know, they're high quality professional conventions. But there's something about the rally that the other ones don't have. And for 300 bucks, you get a pass for you, a pass for your guest. And the other conventions, they're like 375 475 500 dollars for one ticket, and you don't get a full year of taxi with it. So, right. if you're and a member, fun, by the way, is what the other ones are missing. They're very serious and professional, no, right? Professional and serious. They feel corporate, right? And and the taxi one has it's professional. Obviously, it's got great people. <laughs> so but we've it's been also told. <laughs> like, yeah, but it's kind of down to earth fun. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. The the panelists, everybody's like really cool to talk to and fun. It has the personality of Taxi TV, just on yes. a much grander scale. <laughs> there you go. All right, with that, thank you very much. I'm so yeah, glad that you, you told me you were going to be yeah, in town and we pleasure. could do this. Um, so I will see you guys a week from Monday. Remember, no show this coming Monday, which I believe is October 1st, I think. Mm -hmm. All right, so we will see you back again on October 8th, unless another one of our Cherish members comes to town and surprises me. <laughs> with that... We bid you a fond farewell until next time. Thanks, Brandon. Bye.